Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. I'm up on top of the uh, Skylon Tower um, at Niagara Falls. It's a gorgeous sunny day, about 17 Celsius. Beautiful day. And it feels like a, uh, it feels like we're in a plague or something. It feels like a neutron bomb maybe went off. I don't know if you know what a neutron bomb is, but it's a bomb that was worked on decades ago. U.S. apparently perfected it, and uh, it, it's a bomb that basically just kills people with fires out bursts of neutrons when it explodes and kills people in a city, say, but doesn't damage any of the buildings or infrastructure. So anyway, it feels like uh, a bit like that. There's the Horseshoe Falls, the Great Canadian Falls. A huge volume of water goes over, something like 750,000 gallons a second, or I don't know, some, something huge anyway. And over here, we have the uh, Puny um, American Falls over here. Puny uh, American Falls and uh, ginormous, uh, gigantic uh, Canadian Falls. So uh, anyway, this is a, good, a great place to come on a beautiful day. I used to come here uh, when I was a kid growing up, whenever we had relatives from my mom's from Scotland, dad's from England, whenever we had relatives coming over and visiting us, you know, when I was very young um, in Canada, we'd always come to Niagara Falls. Like I got kind of sick of the place, but haven't been back for decades and decades. And it's a really cool place. And I want to give a little bit of a rant video about uh, COVID and about the, you know, we, we all know we're supposed to social distance two meters or 6.6 .6 feet and uh, wash our hands uh, with sanitizer, 80, 70 or 80 percent alcohol. Soap's even better if you have access to a sink and uh, wear masks inside. I'm outside, so don't need to wear a mask. Not sure if it's a regulation here, but I'm, nobody's around, so I think I'm okay. Didn't want to do a video wearing a mask. And uh, yeah, so inside we have to wear them, but you know, the virus is still taking off. It's, it's behaving differently than in March, right? And the number of cases is skyrocketing in Canada. In, well, it was in Canada in, in uh, March, April. And then things were shut down and that flattened the curve and the curve is picking up. So the number of cases is almost equal to what it was back in March, but the death rate is minuscule, you know? So this is a good thing. I don't know, is, uh, are people being treated better in hospitals? Are people taking care of their health and taking more vitamins? Is it, uh, you know, maybe over the summer, people are outside and they get vitamin D from the sun and vitamin D levels are still high. So the effect of the virus on people is less. I'm, I'm not sure that could be a whole bunch of different factors, but I want to mainly talk about indoor environments. Okay. So the, the virus is still spreading indoors and um, it's basically an indoor disease. I mean, you wear masks inside, but what is key inside is uh, ventilation, air ventilation. So if you're in a stuffy room, if a room feels stuffy, that's, it's stuffy because it's getting hot, there's a lot of water vapor in the moisture from people in the room, and high CO2 levels. And the high CO2 levels, that affects your, your thinking. So that room is too airtight. If there's, a, if there's somebody in that room with the virus in the morning, it'll still be there in the afternoon. And as we get to colder weather, the air is drier inside. And this is very bad in terms of the virus. Like if somebody sneezes or coughs, they put out water droplets containing the virus if they're infected, and those water droplets uh, will evaporate much more quickly in dry indoor environments. So when the water droplets ev um, evaporate, the virus that was on the water droplets then goes freely into the air, and it's a lot smaller and a lot lighter. So it will just stay in a room and circulate around for hours and hours and hours, perhaps even the whole day. Um, so people can get infected from, from that. So to avoid that, you need some sort of ventilation in the room. And uh, it's, it's sufficient just to open a uh, window uh, to get, uh, you know, if you open a couple windows in a room and you're inside, then great. That's all that you need to uh, make that room safe, to get that virus out of that room. Because um, I did an experiment with a carbon dioxide monitor. I think that you can measure carbon dioxide in a room and that can be a proxy for air ventilation. So let me explain. I was in a small bedroom and the window was shut and the door was shut and I was in there and I had a CO2 monitor. Initially the monitor was 
415 parts per million, which is the same as that outdoors. Okay, the environmental level. And over time, because that room, everything was closed off, the CO2 level rose. So within a few hours, it was over 1,000 ppm. Within a few more hours, it was 1,500 approaching 2,000 ppm. And the room felt extremely stuffy. Okay, so if there's a virus uh, in that room, then it's going to be in the air floating around and it's not going to leave. So what, what I then did is I did the same experiment, but I cracked a window open. One window in the room, I cracked it just minusculely open a little bit and uh, the CO2 level stayed pegged to the 415. They did not rise to 1,000 or 2,000 or anything like that. Mask. I'm outside. I'm outside. Is that okay? Common sense? Okay. I'm supposed to put a mask on. Okay, I'll, I'll do it in a few minutes. I'm doing a very important uh, viral video here. So, so uh, you want to be on the video? What do you think about climate change? What's your view on... Uh... Oh, he's taken off. There, I think I scared him away. I hope I don't get... I think he's, uh, he's like a Skyline cop. But anyway, it's okay. It's... So, uh, yeah, where was I? Okay, so the CO2 level in a, in a room that has got very poor air circulation is going to rise, of course, with people in the room. And I repeated the experiment with just my cats in the room. I was actually away, but I have a remote access to the CO2 monitor and just a couple of cats in the room, it went way up. And a few years ago, I was away. I was actually in uh, Paris at the climate conference and uh, my wife had a Christmas party about that time and there were loads of uh, people in the house. You know, this was before virus, BV. You know, we can talk about time now is BV and AV, before virus, after virus. So it was uh, BV before virus and you know loads of people in the in the house and the co2 levels shot right up and also there's a acoustic sensor so you can measure noise level and there was huge noise level so i could see you know how long the party lasted and what was going on and the noise level stuff like that but anyway um i repeated the experiment of being in the enclosed room with the window open a lot in one experiment and of course, the CO2 levels in the room stayed at 415, which was nominal, you know, same as outside. And then I, had, I repeated the experiment with the, with the window open as the smallest amount I could get it open. So, you know, the, rather than being shut and sealed, I just opened it the slightest little crack amount. You couldn't even see through the crack really, like just a little tiny little, little bit. And the room level stayed pegged at uh, 415 parts per million. And then I repeated the experiment in a bigger room um, and the CO2 level took a lot longer to go up when it was sealed and when it was, uh, when I had, uh, then I cracked one, you know, windows, you know, multiple windows in that room and the CO2 level stayed pegged. So what I'm saying is if the windows are cracked a little bit, you get enough cross ventilation, keep the indoor, do indoor doors open so you get the best um, airflow from room to room and that's all you need to do so this needs to be done in all public indoor spaces okay even throughout the winter okay if you have the windows cracked a small amount um, you know your heating bill will go up slightly but not significantly but it'll give that ventilation it'll stop that virus that virus will be swept right out of the room there'll be enough air movement that bang, uh, your risk is much, much lower. So I'm talking about, uh, think of the, uh, all the fatalities in the long-term uh, care homes, right? Older people, they like to be super warm. Those rooms are sealed up super tight. And of course, one person gets infected in the whole place and then there's, there's an outbreak in the whole place. So well, you need windows open. Now, some people, as you realize, depending on the building, uh, most windows you can actually open in many, many buildings, like in the high rises, in office buildings, office towers, etc., etc. You can't open the bloody window. So what do you do? Well, it's a very simple solution. Okay, you, you just uh, you can go to the hardware store and you can buy a special drill bit. It's uh, for glass. 
So you buy a little drill bit for glass, you drill a hole in the window at say the top right corner or the bottom right corner or lower corner or whatever. You just drill a little tiny hole. It can just be a little tiny uh, hole in the window in all of these windows. And uh, you know, then the infection, the chance of getting infected in an indoor space like that uh, is going to be extremely low. You know, keep the social distancing, keep wearing a mask, keep sanitizing your hand, but ventilate your indoor spaces and that will crash, that will literally crush the virus like a bug. Like, and it's a very inexpensive fix. I mean, stuff just close, you know, I've been walking around Niagara Falls and like I said, it's like a neutron bomb went off. You know, some of the gift stores, you know, you talk to some of the people there and say, you know, what was the, uh, you know, how much is business down? 90%? And they say, oh yeah, it's, it's down like almost 97% or 95%. Especially in a, in a border town like Niagara Falls. I mean, no U.S. tourists coming across the border, right? All the casinos here have been closed since March and they never reopened. Um, I mean, the, you know, the town is getting crushed. You know, the economy is getting crushed. And, you know, we have to be very careful with the, that we don't make the solution to a problem actually worse than the actual problem, right? So, so I highly, highly recommend, you know, please share this video, please talk about it. The science is there. I mean, there, people have, there's a teacher, I just read a paper recently, a teacher has been, he bought a portable CO2 monitor for a couple hundred bucks and he puts it in his classroom and he's done these experiment with cracking windows and stuff like that and he's written about how CO2 is a proxy, can be a proxy, which is exactly what I'm saying. And I was saying this, you know, if you look from a couple of months ago, back in uh, late February, early March, I was saying the coronavirus is an, in, is an indoor disease and ventilation is key. And, uh, you know, it, we're, we're relearning stuff here. I mean, you could argue, well, the science is suddenly changing and showing that, uh, you know, it's more, the transmission is more in the air than on, um, so-called fomites or surfaces. But, you know, if we look back in 1918, a couple of key things uh, pan out. First of all, well, for, there's a couple lines of evidence I discussed in previous videos. So 1918, okay, mask wearing inside versus uh, in cities, the rates were way lower, mask wear, no mask wearing rates uh, through the roof. Um, hospitals. When people were treated in 1918 in hospitals, field hospitals had fatality rates about one third that of indoor hospitals. Okay, again, indoor hospitals, you know, with windows closed, they're, they're just asking for trouble. Um, the other thing is the seasonality. Why is this thing taking off in uh, winters? Uh, because people are indoors more and the rooms are more, the, the buildings, the indoor environments are sealed off more and uh, like I said, the, uh, the virus that's being carried in water droplets, uh, those droplets won't go through a mask, but when the water droplets evaporate and you've got the, the nano uh, scale uh, virus particles, they can go through anything. They're much smaller, right? They can fit through any fine mesh. So, uh, you know, in much drier environments, the masks aren't so, uh, aren't so uh, protective. Right, that's why one of the reasons there's a lot of controversy over the masks. And uh, also some more recent data, you can look at contract, contact tracing data. And uh, you know, you work backwards um, and uh, you know, see how, where, how the thing, how, how infected people, you know, where, where the infections originated and how, uh, how they um, spread, you know, how, how, how they spread and uh, there was a, a study in, a few studies in China, huge numbers of people looked at. One study, 6,800 people that were infected, they were looked at, where did they get the virus? It was broken down into transportation, like buses and cabs and trains and boats, et cetera. It was, there was outdoor transmission was a category, um, indoor office buildings, et cetera, et cetera. They broke it down and, and tried to do the contact tracing as best they could. And basically, there was only one case in the, of the 6,000, 7,000 cases that was spread by outdoors. Now, we know that the Trump, the, the Rose Lawn event, um, you know, huge transmission outside, but, but it wasn't all just outside. People went inside without masks and people outside were hugging and kissing.